Hi, I'm your host Jürgen Strauss from Innova Biz, and I'm really excited to welcome to the Innova Buzz podcast today, all the way from Brighton Hove in the UK, Matt Garman, who's a sales enablement specialist. Welcome to the Innova Buzz podcast, Matt. It's a great privilege to have you as my guest. Hi, Jürgen. Hi. Now, Mel Blackmore, who was our guest on episode 489 of the Innova Buzz podcast, suggested that we have a conversation with you, Matt. So a big hello to Mel. Yeah, she's, um, she's, uh, Mel's, Mel's a great client. I've been working with uh, Blackmore's for about a year or so. Uh, very, very uh, ambitious business, doing some great things in the certification space. And uh, yeah, I've been I've been working with it with with Mel and the team for about a year or so now, trying to help them scale and develop a uh, a sales function beyond just being the founder. So uh, all, you know, at the moment everything's been reliant on her, and now we're building a function that goes beyond her. And it's it's a topical, it's a fairly typical thing I get involved in. Hmm. Mm, that's fascinating. And I know you work with businesses to find consistency in the sales function. And I, I know also that a lot of that is around process. And that's something that Mel is also very strong on. So there's a good fit there. And there's some other parts to your um, your bow or the feathers in your, your bow, so to speak. And that's um, being a part-time adventurer. So we might touch on some of the exciting things happening later in the year on that side. But before we start talking about all things sales and, and the other fun stuff, what's the impact you're making in the world, Matt? God, I didn't think you'd ask a question like that. I, I think um, fundamentally <laughs> from, from, a, from a business perspective, um, I've, um, we'll touch maybe go into a little bit more detail. I kind of, like many people, I stumbled into sales um, but, uh, maybe in terms of impact at the moment, I think that I, be, I have this, I have this deep belief that the way that we recruit on board and, uh, and integrate sales resources, particularly new sales resources into businesses, I, I have this deep belief that it's fundamentally broken. And the reason, the reason for that is just high cost of high cost of overhead high cost of onboarding then we've got talent wars going on i don't know what it's like in australia but we've got talent wars in the uk and and i just believe that we far too often we set sales people up to fail as opposed to succeed and i'm quite passionate about about doing a better job about that mm. yeah i, I suspect that's not just true of salespeople, but I guess given that's your area of specialty, that, that's where you can make a difference, right? So what are, what are some of the failings you see and, and how do you, how are you addressing them? Yeah, so I have this, uh, so we got this, um, I think, uh, I, I, again, I, I mean, I, I say I, I stumbled into sales, but the one thing that happened in my uh, and my sales at the time was an induction in, in, in around the 1990 in, and my induction into sales was selling life insurance. But the really important thing is that it, it came with 12 and I didn't really appreciate it at the time, but it, it, at the time I thought this is a bit strung out, but it came with 12 weeks worth of training. And, um, and anyway, and I was, and, and so 12 weeks, and then that was actually a commission only job. It didn't even have any salary. And yet we, they invested in 12 weeks of training with us. And, and I was speaking at an event earlier on in the year. And, and, and obviously this whole thing about induction, immersion and onboarding, uh, I'm very passionate about. And, and I suggested to the audience that was mostly CEOs that we've shortcut, we try to shortcut too many things in our life. And, um, and, and particularly in our business, we try to get faster and faster before actually laying down the foundations. And, and I actually suggested that there may be some sales resources that are working for some of those CEOs that maybe haven't had 12 weeks of sales training in their careers, let alone in their induction and onboarding. Mm. And, um, and yeah, unfortunately, uh, I, I say I can only speak for sales, but uh, unfortunately, we... Um, because somebody seems to have had a sales role before or, or we just assume that people can absorb all the information necessary for a um, for within a sale to sell on behalf of an organization we just 
you, it's like we, we just think it's going to happen through osmosis. And, uh, you know, we sit somebody in a chair, we maybe sit them next to <laughs> yeah. somebody, we give them access to the CRM system, we pretty much expect people to get on with it. And, um, and I say, I just think it's, I just think it's, I, I, it beggars belief, particularly with the, the costs involved with, uh, with, with recruitment, senior management time, interviewing, all these sorts of things that we, we then just rely on them, you know, hitting the road, you know, sticking or twisting sort of thing. And it's, uh, that's one of the things I'm, I'm, I'm passionate about trying to change. Mm. All right. Well, what, let's talk a bit more about your work specifically. So how are you going about changing that? Well, I've been running a, before, before, um, before I ran a sales consultancy, I was, I, I grew, ended up growing and selling two tech companies of my own. And one of the things we were, we were really, really good about and one of the one of the things that the acquiring business were interested in is the structure and the disciplines that we've embedded in the business. So since that, since selling the second company, um, I've been working in sales consultancy for uh, I think we've, we've worked since, since since the end of 2012 so, and we've worked with over um, about, we're up to about 120 clients we've worked with. And what's really interesting is so many of those organizations say to me that they've got sales challenges that maybe, I don't know, they, they, they don't do enough training. Um, they don't have consistency amongst the sales resources. So somebody's always top of the charts and somebody's always dragging, the, dragging up the bottom. Um, we never close what we forecast in the, in the pipeline. You know, and, and probably very poor qualification or discovery. And, and, and for me, I, I typically ask a client, um, and this date, this dates back to this dates back to the life insurance days when we had a ring binder, which we referred to as the playbook. <laughs> and I actually say yeah. to I say to clients, it's like, well, you've got challenges. Um, what's in the playbook? And you'd be amazed quite how often I just get blank faces. It's like, what do you mean a playbook? And um, and it's mm. like, I kind of the way I ex give an example is like, well. If you had um, a project manager in your organization, you know, they would probably have undergone some sort of Prince 2 methodology training. Or if it was manufacturing, they would go through some MRP. There'd be a process. And even 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 accounting and bookkeeping, there's a double entry. So there's a there's a tried and tested way of doing things. And and it just it's just we, we seem to um, we seem to have this um, hire and fire mentality when it comes to sales resources. Uh, because we think we have this this mindset quite often that it's a transient position. Oh, I'll just go and hire a sales resource. Um, and, and, and don't get me wrong, I think maybe some sort of previous um, uh, unscrupulous salespeople in the past in the 80s style of selling may have may have influenced that. I don't, I don't know, but um, but yeah, we seem to, <laughs> yeah, we seem yeah. to position it as a little bit of a transient role, and, and and therefore it doesn't necessarily get the investment on quite a lot of within quite a lot of organisations that it needs to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and one one of the things also in in that kind of situation is particularly for bigger companies, they have a sales team, and and so each person on that sales team has their own way of doing things so there's no kind of coordinated approach and if somebody's working with a customer and and for some reason another salesperson spends some time working with that customer whether it's to cover them on holidays or illness then all of a sudden the customer's thoroughly confused because no this is not the way we've been doing it yeah well it's interesting i think it's a very very good point you make i think one of the um I, I, I'm not just and just to be clear, I'm not I'm not I'm not for turning sales people. I'm not to, I'm not for turning individuals into Daleks. I'm I'm you know, I want I, I'm yeah. very much, uh, you know, I want to I want to see people's personality and and and, and um, personality and styles. I want to see those develop. But I do believe that it needs, you know, there, there are there are some fundamentals and there are some ways that, you know, all organizations, um, you know, this is the way that we do stuff. You know, these are the these as a, a classic example of, um, of, of, of of when I, I you know, it's like, well, 
I was I was with, out with a salesperson probably about probably about three four months ago, and I thought we were going with this with this salesperson for a closing meeting and uh, to, to to close a piece of business, and um, and the the client quite legitimately and quite rightly came back with some objections as to you know for what about this what about that, and it was surprising how much that particular sales resource floundered. And when we came back, we actually were, okay, so we, we ended up walking away with the order, which was great. But in the car, we were, we were actually going through the reflection phase of it. And I said, well, there were some objections coming up there and you didn't have particularly robust responses to them. Now, the chances are, yeah, there's always some rejection. There's always, you know, cost, time, capacity. You know, there's, mm. there's always there's always the same, you know, there's always some fairly typical responses that come back from prospects of prospective buyers. And one of the things it's like, well, why don't we do, why don't we why don't we understand what these are, digest them, come up with high quality, robust responses that hopefully further engage the prospects as a total customers, as opposed to just, you know, it's it's not good enough these days to just turn around and say, well, we're nicer than the competition. We're better than the competition. We have to have something <laughs> a lot more rigorous yeah. and a lot more robust. And and, and 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 when I talk about when I talk about a playbook, you know, I, I expect I expect people to be able to uh, to to uh, to operate in a cohesive way. And, and and the other thing is that you know when you've got people that are top of the charts and some people that maybe not quite performing, I have this this mindset. It's like well, we may not be able to. We may not be able to uh, replicate the top performer in terms of personality and style or, or charisma, but what we can do is we should be able to model the masters, as in copy the the, the disciplines mm. that that person does or those people do, and copy the resp the robustness of their responses, the robustness of their questioning, and and basically build. And which is going back to what I do most of the day job is help a client, help a, a, an organization build a playbook that represents the best and most cohesive version of, you know, of, of them in terms of sales capability. And that's, and that's really, really, and then obviously just what that fuels then is it fuels the new, 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 new resources when they come into the organization, because we've got something substantial to work with as opposed to I'll just go and sit there and, 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 and hopefully learn from them. Because obviously so much of what we can do within a sales function can be disciplined, can, can be disciplined, and it can be repetitive. Yeah, yeah. And then you have all that documented, which can be the basis of, of the training program, the onboarding program. Totally. And, and, and um, I have this other, I don't know whether it's a little bit of a utopian view, but um, I was looking at some, um, you know, some statistics that was coming out of the states. I'm, I'm quite, I read quite a lot about sales in general, and you know, the um, some of the reports that I were re was reading that you know the average tenure of a sales senior sales resource these days is 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 19 months, and it's been falling. It's actually stabilised at the right. moment, but it's actually yeah. been falling for quite some time. But if you say 19, if you said 19 months, and I, I know some people that. They've never not been in one role for 19 months. But anyway, that's those are the numbers that I was presented with. And interestingly, the same interestingly, the same um, the same report, um, sorry, the same uh, same author and the same same outlet. Um, a, a month or two later, they suggest they, they, they had a poll that was about the um, the ramp up time. So how long does it take for a net new sales resource? to be useful. Now, I don't mean necessarily mean, mean being paid back all the original investment, but actually contributing mm. to the figures. Uh, and the, the, they came up with a, with a kind of nine to 10 months. And this was a panel, for, I think it was about 3000 sales leaders. You know, they all kind of, we got to about an average, an average nine to 10 months. So if you actually consider that, we've got a very, very short window <laughs> based on average turnover to actually yeah. start start you know getting these these things going and and my view i have this i have this uh this probably utopian view about onboarding and i call it d minus 30. so you know if you if you make the assumption that somebody's going to accept a job you know let's just say we shook hands and uh, we shook hands and, and uh, on uh, on on me joining your business jürgen 
then, um, you know, I, I might have a one month, 30 day notice period that I need to serve. Mm. But wouldn't it be a great idea if you were able, when you off, when we shake hands, that you actually provided me with a log on to your onboarding environment and your sales playbook digitized so that you've got digital access to all that material. And I actually did this with a client recently. So, so we onboarded two new uh, sales development reps um, and we actually tested them on the day that they walked in the office. We actually tested them on the sales playbook. And if you think about that, how much of, how, 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 um, how much of an advantage they've got and how engaged they are with the organization. Mm. Not so, and also culturally, you know, some cultural alignments as well. So introducing to the manager and those sorts of things. But, but so we've got a one month, you know, we've bought ourselves a free month, basically, of onboarding. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, what we do is we sit somebody down on a chair, we give them the CRM, we give them the log on, we ask them to make a few phone calls when they're happy. And then probably what happens in all too often in three or four months time, you know, Jürgen meets Matt in the corridor when it's quiet at the end of the day. And Jürgen says to Matt, do you know what, Matt? It's kind of not really working, is it? And all of that becomes just a big, <laughs> big waste of time. And, um, and uh, yeah, and we go back to square one and we've probably, we've probably swept, I don't know, in the UK, we've probably swept 50,000 pounds off of the, taking 50,000 pounds off the P&L for, the, for that period of time. Mm. So to me, as I say, I said at the beginning, I just fundamentally think that the way that we've got, been going about things won't serve us in the future. Yeah. Well, that that principle of D minus thirty, I think that's that's brilliant, and and it's not just to take advantage of that time to build the knowledge of the new person coming into the business. That and once they get into the business, they you know if they've taken the time to read and study that information, they they then might be in a position if that's really good information. They might be in a position to start contributing from day one of their actual employment. It's actually psychologically, I think, really great because I imagine and I've been in this position a couple of times where I've been given stuff where I've started a new job or I've been about to start a new job. I've had an offer. I've accepted the offer. I've had four weeks notice. So during that four weeks notice, of course, I'm switching off from the last thing. I can't wait to start this new thing. And now I've got all this stuff that they've given me already. So for me, that excitement of that new thing is building up and building up. So I'm, I'm ready, not just if I invest the time in learning those new things, I'm not just coming in with a, a knowledge base that's different to somebody walking in cold. I'm also coming in with the attitude of, this is fantastic, I can't wait to start. You know, I've been waiting for four weeks to get in here and do something. We massively, massively underestimate the uh, the emotional involvement of a net new hire. Um, I'm not allowed. I'm not going to, I've written a couple of books, and sorry, it's not a plug. But the second book I wrote, which is it, is actually called "Why So Many Sales Hires Fail." And um, within there, I actually drew. I've drawn uh, like a series of emojis about the emotional feelings of both <laughs> the hiring person sorry, the, the sales manager or the hiring manager and the new recruit. And there is that emotional roller coaster. So imagine if you've, you know, you've, uh, and also, I mean, I speak to people on a regular basis and they've gone through the whole process and believe it or not, sometimes the new hire just doesn't turn up. Um, and and, and it's, 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 a, it's a disconnect. And I think, I think what I, my, I have this belief that the onboarding starts the moment that somebody accepts the job. Um, because that, and unfortunately, what, what typically happens is that one month, you know, that one month be between, between accepting the job, uh, let's just, I mean, it, it can be less, it can be more, but let's just say it's a month. That one month between accepting mm. the job the day that you physically turn up on site, there's all sorts of emotions and thoughts are going on. You know, the, the, the incumbent employer may come back with a counter offer. Um, there may be an alternative, mm. another, another angle and stuff like that. So, so to me, it just makes perfect sense that you engage that person both um, academically, mentally within by, by giving them access to your, your, your tools, your methodology and playbook, but 
But also, I, I, you know, I call it a buddy up. You know, make sure that you've got a buddy. They've got a buddy within the business that they can rely on. Go out for a coffee in the run up if you can, or a beer or something in the run up, because you want that. Though you want those people to feel part of it. You know, and I know lots and lots of there's some amazing organisations these days that do some fantastic cultural change things and, and in, in, engaging, and, and that's a that's a great thing. But you know, I just I just see that, and, and particularly with sales, it's like. That, that whole month, that whole month where it's like, you know, have I made the right decision? Is this right for me? You know, I've now got my partner, my other half. We other, you know, we've all got pressures and we all live, live, live um, mm. busy lives. Um, but there is, you know, there's that, that, that piece there of, 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 of providing tools, information, wisdom, access you know, and because uh, because otherwise, what happens is the new new recruits you don't see them in that period of time. They turn up on day one, and um, you know, and 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 then we're trying to absorb so much information in a short period of time. There's pressure to try and make some calls or try to create some sales activity, and um, yeah, it's just it's just to me, it's just lost time, and I think it creates it, it creates unnecessary pressure both with the with the new hire and also the manager, the, the, the managers as well, you know. Mm. Yeah, and the other thing that I think it, it brings about, and I, and I remember this from my corporate time when I was hiring people and I wasn't doing this D minus 30, full confession. Um, what sometimes happened was that somebody would have their first day and then I needed to free up some time to spend with them. And inevitably, the week before or the day before they started, something would come up that kind of demanded my full attention. So yeah. I was not in a position to actually spend any time with them. And, of course, then if you look at that from the point of view of the new hire, they come in and, oh, nobody's, nobody's got time for me or the important people haven't got time for me. So it's, it's a really bad start. Yeah, it's, it, it, it happens. It happens too often. Um, and, you know, I hear I, you know, I, if you, yeah, if you listen to you know, the numerous podcasts and numerous articles and content pieces, you know, everyone says very much about the, uh, you know, our, our, our staff are our biggest asset. Well, let's change the culture a little bit <laughs> and actually let's, make, let's actually, let's not talk about it. Let's actually do it's... it a little bit better. Yeah, let's say, I'm, I'm, do it. Not, and behave, I know a lot yeah, of people do like a great job, but I, I just do believe that, um, particularly, I mean, my, my I say area of expertise in sales and onboarding is that um, we could do a hell of a lot better than, than than we do more often than not, and 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 it's just, and I think this, the, you know, this there's the there's the emotional cultural connection with the organisation. Um, but it can go pretty stale. We all know it can go pretty stale and pretty, pretty useless. You know, pretty, pretty poor quite quickly. When somebody's made their mind up and they're not getting the support, they're just going to go. And and worse, worse still is, as I said before, is is that we and and, and I'm going to be critical of certain sales leaders and sales directors. We we kind of we we write those costs off as a cost of running a sales function you know and, and you might have a business that that might have turned over 10 or 10 or 15 sales resources in a year you know and if you if you don't depend on the size of the sales team but if you don't if you if you cut that down by 50 percent you know by better onboarding and better induction processes and better knowledge storage uh, when those people come online you not only you not only you're you're de-risking your investment in the people, but you're also rapidly reducing your your ramp up period of time. So that the period of time when they can be productive uh, is is significantly less. So if we go back to that nine or ten month window, if we were able to onboard basically for free, so we're not paying any salary for D minus mm. thirty, we're not paying anything for that. Yeah. So we, if we're buying a month, we're buying a month early. But we're also able to possibly, by doing it, buy ourselves another two or three months worth of reducing that period of time of the ramp up. Then, you know, that's a quarter, you know, and that doesn't necessarily, as there's not just the cost assigned to that, but there's also a significant opportunity cost there by not having the people ready, mm. ready and prepared to actually to, to, to sell and promote the products and services. 
And on top of that, I think with companies like that, that's where they might be at the top end of the statistical distribution of that, where that 19 months is in the medium. So they're probably going to hang on to their salespeople on average for, for much longer than that 19 months, because not only that onboarding, I'm imagining if they're really that good about the onboarding, then the whole culture is is very positive and there's a whole lot of other things that happen after somebody starts that that contribute to that same culture well everyone that's the other benefit of having a playbook everyone knows what the rules and the expectations are so it's the bar it's the expectation bar and the standards that we operate mm. to so it's almost like a standard operating procedure for sales um yeah. and if you don't have that then we have we've just got that ambiguity and um, and, it, and and then when somebody you know it's it's oh they're not here anymore oh that was a bit harsh wasn't it or what took you so long you know those are, we have those sorts of conversations but mm. it's all it's all out for it's all out you know the, the clearer things are the clearer the pathway and this also goes for um for uh for promotion as well you know when somebody comes into a let's just say somebody comes into a junior sales role they don't want to be a junior sales they don't want to be in a junior sales role forever you know they want to progress and they want to see what progression looks like and so what's really really equally important is 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 showing somebody what the runway looks like you know if you do really really well here this is where you go and if you do really really well there then you go up here and if you do really really well there that's what that's what it looks like moving forward and uh, so, so providing not only the onboarding, but also the runway as to uh, to develop. Now, granted, that's a little bit more difficult in a smaller organisation. Mm. But in a larger organisation, it should be a lot. We should be able to be a lot clearer on um, on on what that 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 roadmap looks like. Yeah, that's right. But paradoxically, I think you know my experience has been in the larger organisations that they do that even less. There might be so. It, there might be a kind of secret cabal, if you like, that that gets that kind of treatment, but most people don't. No, no, no. Very much, very. Um, I see it very rare. I mean, we. Um, I was uh, speaking for a group over in the UK, and over it was uh, during 2019. Uh, so during the, the 2019, I did. Some, I can't remember. What it was, I think there was about 21 workshops that I hosted that were mostly. Uh, not hosted that I was asked to speak at. There were mostly sort of CEO uh, networking groups, sort of, you know, 15, 16 people in the room and stuff. And um, and I asked about, you know, we asked, I got the same usual sales challenges, the salespeople are rubbish, we don't close on, all, all the usual things that I expect to hear. Um, but I actually asked, right? and I, as I said before, I said, well, what's in the playbook? And, um, and, and believe it or not, the 97% that year of 2019 when before covid when we when i was out and about doing doing more and more of these workshops so um you know 97 percent said that they didn't have anything fully documented from a sales onboarding or a sales playbook approach so and then there were th mm. there were three percent there were three percent which didn't equate to a large volume um, and i said fantastic well done i said could you send me a copy of i'd love to see a copy of what you use uh, and I received two copies of things, you know, of, of and, and granted they were they were a lot better than than than, than some, um, but uh, yeah, there was a lot that you know, it's a, just unfortunately, still a lot of a lot of organisations, particularly when it comes to sales, uh, we just don't we don't prepare people well enough. And as I say, I, I stand by, I think we set people up to fail as opposed to succeed. Mm. All right, so one of the things that you have as a business is called sales enabler and uh, it's software if i understand correctly it's SaaS software that has best practice sales playbooks and tools and resources all embedded within it so tell me a little bit more about that is that something that's generic or is that something that's a framework where businesses can customize their own or work with you to customize it how does it work yeah, so um, I say I ref we, we worked on we work with. Excuse me, my dog wants to come and sit under my desk. But <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, she'll be okay. She'll be she behaves now. But um, 
we um, yeah. So so I reflected on these hundred and twenty or so clients that we worked on worked with, and um, and one of the things I looked at is like, well, what did we actually do for these companies? And um, and going back to it, a lot of it is that whole consistency approach side of things, where um, consistency of approach and structure and, and all the things that I talked about in the old life insurance ring binder. So, um, and, uh, so a vast majority of those clients that we work with on the consulting, um, this is what we did for them. So um, anyway, a couple of years ago, I started sketching out, well, you know, could we automate a load of things? So ultimately what Sales Enabler is, it's a digital sales playbook, which is, it's very much a, a platform environment. So it allows, you know, we've put a whole, a whole heap of suggestions. The latest version's got temp, some of our consulting templates in there. Uh, we've got, um, you know, we can create, you know, best practice libraries uh, and plays. So what happens within the state? And, mm. and everything, everything is customizable so that, um, as I say, a client or a user of Sales Enabled can basically build the best version of them. And then obviously we share that across, share that across the piece. You know, things, if there's new case studies or examples, they get inserted as well. And so everyone's, everyone's got the information at their fingertips. And that's, so that's the essence of Sales Enabler. Um, you know, we, we obviously provide support and coaching and consulting around that if we need to, but we also have some clients that, um, we have some clients that, that just pick it up and run with it um, and just do everything themselves, completely self-service, which is great. Um, they're typically the ones that are, you know, properly invested in, in, in their sales function because they, they see the value of enablement. Mm. Um, and then we've also got some sales consultants that are other, you know, outside of our business, independent sales consultants that use Sales Enabler as, their, as the reinforcement tool for their coaching and their 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 coaching and training that they provide to their clients as well, so a, a, a myriad. But it's, ultimately, it's 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 not you know people say it's like CRM and it's like no, it's very much about the best practice um, and, and instilling mm. best practice. And then then also, I mean, we do we can connect to CRM systems. So it, 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 in that instance, it kind of acts as a uh, an aid memoir sort of thing for the uh, for the sales resources when they're at a certain part of a sales deal or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a brilliant resource. And it highlights that for those people that don't necessarily have a playbook and think, well, building something like this in today's day and age where it needs to be online, it needs to be perhaps mobile friendly. So the salesperson out on a call can just jump on, on their mobile phone and perhaps look something up very quickly. Um, they don't have to build it from scratch. There's something available. Yeah, and the other th the other thing is 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 um, and again, I mean, I'm working with working with a couple of organisations, and they're you know they're in the fintech space, and um, some of these people haven't had a you know a thoroughbred sales background, so hmm. it's 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 it, it's very very time consuming to build something uh, to develop a playbook or something like that if. If it's very time consuming, if you've got a day job, as in you've got to run a sales team or anything else like that, so it's very time. But it's even worse. It's even worse because you know, quite a lot of organisations, you know, and I'm a great believer in the fact that you don't know what you don't know. So, um, so that that you know, what we what we do is we've got a lot of kind of spoon fed information there that prompts people to come up with, start thinking a little bit more about what the best version of them actually looks like. Mm. Yeah, fantastic. All right, Matt, I, this has been wonderful. I think it's a good point now to move on to the buzz, which is our innovation round of five questions, same five that I ask of every guest. And the idea is that you'll inspire the listener to go and do something awesome, take some action today as a result. So you wow. ready? <laughs> yeah, <let's> try it. <laughs> All right. What's the number one thing anyone needs to do to be more innovative? Try things. Try things, and don't be don't be scared. Don't be scared to fail. Mm. Just don't be scared run to experiments. Fail. Yeah. Don't be scared. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I I like the idea. I kind of reframe this in the idea of running an, ex an experiment. So there's no failure in an experiment. There's possibly a result that wasn't what you expected 
in which case you ask yourself, what did you learn from that? Yeah, totally, totally. Just, um, you know, we're, uh, life's a journey and uh, we never get it right straight away. So, uh, yeah, no, don't, don't be scared. Don't be scared and don't listen to the naysayers, but don't be scared to fail. <laughs> Excellent. All right, what's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas? Um... I never used to be much of a reader and I made a conscious, I started, um, I start, I started, um, naively penning a few thoughts. A couple of people have said to me before on my sales <laughs> journey, my business journey, they said to me, Matt, you ought, you ought to write a book. And then I started penning <laughs> a lot of thoughts. This was probably about five, six years ago. And, um, and they were just scribblings and scribblings and scribblings. And then I, I actually, I was, I had this thought, this, this, this something came to me one day and it's like, do you know what? You're not qualified to do this writing a book type stuff because you don't consume enough of other people's quality content. So um, for the last five, six years, I've been, a, I've been an avid reader and consumer of, 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 of information. Um, you know, some of it, some of it self-development, some of it sales, some of it business, um, some of it completely left field um, and sporting. Um, but yeah, so I, I think the biggest thing that me is I've, I've started consuming a lot more of other people's content. Mm. Mm. And of course, you have written a couple of books since you first started penning those ideas, right? Yeah, so um, so the first one was a bit of a uh, the first one was was the the culmination of the scribblings, <laughs> which was a little bit of a journey about <laughs> my stumbling into sales and actually the importance of of um, of, uh, of of having sales and structure. That book's called Learning the Ropes, um, and the second book, as I said, which has got me, it started with a few frustrations about onboarding. The second book's called uh, Why So Many Sales Hires Fail. Mm. Excellent. And we'll include the links to those two books, obviously, in the show notes as well. Now, do you have a favorite resource you use most often? Resource um, for professionally or, or just go, a, oh, well, whatever. go to resource? Yeah. Um, I don't have a, I don't think I've got a single resource. I've, I've, um, Somebody, somebody, somebody came up with an idea once um, about probably about ten years ago that we ought to, in the same way that a business has uh, has a some non execs, um, that we ought to have some life, um, some life a, 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 a network. So I, I I've got three or four people in my life who um, I they're my kind of go tos. And mm -hmm. um, I kind of they're my, they're like my own they're like my own private board if that makes sense but they're not a board yeah. they're just they're they're people that I I respect a lot I value their input um, there's no um, there's no um, yeah, there's no commercials on that or as one of them's got some commercials um, but they're just genuinely people that. I know I've got my best interest at heart. Now I generally buy the coffees or the lunch because I, you know, and, and so once a quarter or something like that, I just, you know, each of those people, I, I, uh, I try and pick their brains as much as anything else as well. And, and so, so not a single, not a single resource, mm. um, but I'm very fortunate and, and very open-minded as well, actually, um, to, uh, to try and get other people's, other people's wisdom. Cause it's, it's, I feel it's hard. In, it's a hard enough journey that we're all on as it is, without getting, without, um, without, you know, without limiting ourselves to uh, to reaching out to people. Yeah, yeah, and and I guess the that my virtual philosophy, board, I, I will call it. Yeah, I guess that philosophy of that human connection it certainly underpins a lot of what we've talked about today in terms of um, the sales and the process around sales is it's not just a mechanical robot going through the motions it's there's that human connection um there and and you're certainly bringing that in here yeah. 
Now, the next one we may have already covered, but what's the best way to keep a client on track? On a uh, client on track, um, I think, I think um, one of the, something, I guess, something I, I heard in a, uh, in, a, in a sales meeting about 15, 20 years ago, and I use it quite regularly myself, is, um, is when somebody says, uh, when you're trying to understand exactly what somebody's looking for, and uh, and they said and I they said they said like so um so Jurgen if you could close your eyes and just describe to me what your definition of success looks and feels like okay if you could just close your eyes and tell me that then that would be really really helpful for me um so it's it's something I use very regularly with clients it's like if you can close your eyes and tell me what you, not only what it looks like but also what, what it, it feels, feels like, like yeah. then I can not only get the functional element of it as well, but I can get the emotional element of it as well. And and then then when mm. it comes to, you know, it's like, well, this is what you said uh, in terms of keeping the client mm. on track. This is what you said you wanted, and this is what you said you wanted to feel. Um, and I, look, we can always change our minds. That's absolutely fine. But this is where we started from, mm. okay? This is where, so we started with you saying that, that gave us an, est an, an indication of what success looked and felt like. So we're hopefully somewhere on that journey. And it's, it's, a, it's a benchmark as well that we can always come back to. Mm. Yeah, great question. I love it. All right. Now, what's the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves? Stay in your swim lane. So, so do what you're good at. Just, just I think, mm. try and do what you're really good at, um, and um, and and be yourself. I think far too what I'm. I've been guilty. I'm. I'm. I'm still guilty of 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 dipping into things that a little bit half-heartedly, or dipping into some things because I think I've got an opinion. But I'm not an absolute expert, um, and I think what one of the things that 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 I've done, particularly actually, uh, uh, we've had, we've all had some in, enforced lockdown stuff, um, is actually focus on what you're re genuinely really really good at, and try not to stray too far from that, um, and um, mm. and yeah, just 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 be as as good as you possibly can, uh, and the other thing is is. It, it, uh, Don't go, don't go forcing the issue. Sometimes as well. Sometimes, sometimes you've got to, you've got to, you've got to be a little bit patient. And um, and somebody once described to me that you know it's a bit like sitting on a pond. If you sit on the side of a pond and just chuck out some good, if you chuck a stone into the pond, but it's good quality stuff, it's good quality content. If you chuck a stone out into the pond, every now and then you're going to get a ripple back. And sometimes you're going to get a ripple back when you're not expecting it. So um, so stick yeah. to your knitting. Stick to what you're good at. And I'd say give out, try and give out the best version of you as much as you can. Mm. Yeah, I love it. Great metaphor too. <laughs> Sometimes it takes, depending how far you throw, it takes a while for the ripples to come back. <laughs> De definitely. All right. Well, thanks, Matt. This has been fabulous. Now, where can people find out more about you and the work you do and maybe even reach out and say thanks for what you've shared today? Uh, yeah, so... Um, We've got a website, uh, Sales Enabler. I know, you, I know you said earlier on you, you highlighted the enabler. It's spelt S A L E S E N A B L A dot com. Sales Enabler dot com. Um, I am simply Matt with two T's at Sales Enabler dot com. Um, I've got a Twitter handle which I haven't used much lately. Is uh, Mr. Matt Garman. <laughs> Um, so yeah, those are, those are the, those are the best, best ways of getting in contact with me. Excellent. And we'll post those in the show notes too. So do you have some parting advice you'd like to leave the listener today? Something that they can immediately turn into an action 
from today's conversation? I just, you know, I, I, I do believe that, I do believe that life's a journey. We're, none of us are here forever. So give the best version of yourself as much as you possibly can. Um, give more than you take in whatever you do. I think um, that's something I try and I try and stick to. So give more than you take, um, and just don't be scared. Just go in there, have a crack, and mm. you know if it if it doesn't work out, then then it doesn't work out. You know, but um, yeah, don't be scared. Just try it. I say to the children, you know, we we we. Um, Far too often, my children, my ch children in their early teens, and sometimes they're a little bit fussy when it comes, or they have been in the past, a bit a bit fussy when it comes to food, and they go, "Dad, Dad, I don't like it," and it's like, "You haven't <laughs> tried it." So, um, yeah, 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 but I don't. It's like, well, you cannot tell me. And and my one of my things with the children is feel, taste, touch, smell as many things as you can in life. And there are going to be some things you like, and there's going to be some things you don't like. But until you've tried it, you can't pass comments. Yeah. So just go and, go and have a go at as many things <laughs> as you possibly can. <laughs> Love it. And that's a great analogy as well. And I can relate to that uh, from my days of raising children, which are behind <laughs> me now. So I'm, I'm survived all that. <laughs> Well done. All right. Finally, Matt, who else should I bring on the show and why? Oh. Wow. Um, there's a guy I do some work with who's, a, who's an incredible explorer, a chap called Neil Lawton. And he's um, he has... He's, well, I don't know what he hasn't done, to be honest with you. I think he's got about <laughs> six or seven Guinness World Records. Um, he's summited Everest. He's paddle boarded around um, Easter Island, uh, Elephant Island, I think. Um, he's a, he's a, uh, and, and, and he's great company. So he's, he's, a, he's a great guy. Um, there's a, there's a, a friend of mine who I've been fishing with, a gentleman called John Creamer. And John is an expert on reading people. Mm. And uh, he's very, very good company. So um, he, he, he would be a very, very good, uh, very, very good uh, interview. Um, yeah, those two, those two would be quite interesting characters. Excellent. Well, John maybe and we Matt. Talk, maybe oh, talk about yeah. that offline or separately. Yeah, we'll see if we can bring those on the show. And it reminded me that um, you've got a big adventure coming up as well, uh, rowing across the Atlantic later in the year. <laughs> yeah, we'll so when I, I probably leave that I, for I, people to read about him. Yeah, I probably, uh, I, I, again, I, I'm, my wife complains about it. It's like, you, you know, you said you like to feel, taste, touch, smell as many things as you can in life. It's like, <laughs> Surely at some stage that uh, we can refrain from doing the crazy stuff. But no, I've done outside, I've done some <laughs> sporty challenges, the Ironman and the Channel Swim and bits and pieces. But my current, my current project is uh, I've, put a team of, uh, I've put a team of three dads together and, uh, and we're rowing across the Atlantic Ocean in December of this year. So uh, the team's called uh, Ocean Dad Venture. And, uh, and we've got a website for that as well, which is www.oceandadventure.com. So uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a crazy thing that we think, we, we think we can get across the Atlantic in about a month and a half. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, that sounds exciting. So thanks so much, Matt, for sharing your insights on sales with us today and sharing that little gem with us at the end there. Um, I really enjoyed our conversation learned quite a bit about how you approach the sales and this idea of the D minus 30 is just brilliant. I think if people take that away and implement it in their business, then that's, um, that's been worth spending the time here and listening to this episode, just, just that one little takeaway. So thanks again, really appreciate it. Please do stay in touch. And if we don't talk beforehand, I'm sure we will, but just in case, all the best for that Atlantic crossing. 
Thank you very much. Thanks for, thanks for inviting me to be along. That's great. It's been good fun.